You know, I, I consider myself incredibly fortunate. Um, I get to, you know, get up every day and do something that I'm uh, super passionate about, just in, in getting to work in hockey. Um, but uh, the best part of my job and the best part of my week, outside of hanging out with my two boys, is doing the Glass Now podcast. And I get to talk with some of the uh, the best leaders in our game. Um, I, I feel incredibly grateful, and it's been honestly the best education in just about every aspect of my life because these folks not only have high standards in how they approach the professional lives, but I've come to learn they have high standards in how they operate in, in every facet of their life. So, and uh, we get a, a lot of notes from, from coaches that you know I think listen to the show on a regular basis. I'll get notes on LinkedIn, social media, et cetera. And, it, and it, it means the world to me. And myself and uh, Justin, like it's too dark, I can't see. Justin's somewhere over there, he's our producer. So him and I, um, again, we get to do this every week and it's a big thrill. So uh, with all that being said, uh, today's guest needs no introduction. However, if anybody here uh, ever finds themselves as a contestant on Jeopardy and you're faced with the question, um, in his mid-20s, he co-founded a semi-professional hockey league in Texas. We're about to give you the answer to that question. Pre please help me welcome the general manager of the Toronto Maple Leafs, Mr. Brad Trey Living. <laughs> Brad. Hey Aaron, how you doing? Doing good, man. Good, thank you, thank you. Put everybody to sleep, last speaker of the day here, so. <laughs> um, so, one of us used to be a gritty stay-at-home defenseman. The other one used to be a backup goalie. I'll let you guys figure out who's who. Um, how was your summer? It was good. It feels like it's over based on the weather that we had here today. But uh, no, it's been, um, it's been a good summer. Um, as we all probably realize, you, um, you always need a little time to decompress and get away and, and sort of reboot a little bit, and uh, in management, it seems like there's fewer and fewer of those days. The, the summer goes longer and longer, the season goes, it's, it's 12 months, but we get a little bit of time. We've got a place out in, out in British Columbia. I'm originally from British Columbia, so we got a place out in the Okanagan um, that uh, I find I get there less and less every year. My wife and daughter daughters spend a lot of time out there, but... Uh, we, we, get a, we get a little bit of time out there, and, uh, but we're excited to be back, and, and we're getting going this, this week with, uh, with rookie camp, so uh, we're ready to get rolling. Well, listen, you, I mean, you've been in this arena for a long time. Um, over the course of your career, um, you know, whether it's in the off-season or perhaps even in-season, have you developed any, any hobbies or, or kind of ways that you can divert your attention and get your mind off hockey for a little bit? Well, I tried, I, I tried to... For years, I was golf. I golfed a lot, and yeah. it got worse and worse. It seems like the more I played, and um, you know, now, now I've got I've got a daughter that's in university. She's down in Texas. My oldest is in grade twelve, and with the move out here, um, my wife and my youngest stayed back in Calgary last year and this year just to get her through. Just felt to get her through high school. So this summer. Uh, with not seeing them a whole bunch, you know, me picking up the golf bag wasn't it, that didn't go over sure. real well. Um, so I just find now getting out on the water a little bit, and, yeah, uh, and and just just spending time trying to relax, I like to fish a little bit, but really um, getting out in the water and relaxing and uh, and spending time that way is 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 my favorite way to decompress. And anytime I'm around water, it's usually pretty good. I bet, I bet. Um, so, you know, it's interesting when we, 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 you know, talk with folks on this show and, you know, if I wanted to be an accountant or a lawyer, um, I'm not saying it would be easy, but I could probably map out the steps required to, you know, to, to break into that career. But, you know, whether you're being an NHL coach, an NHL general manager, um, you know, that, those paths aren't so clear. And it seems to me that everybody just has their unique story and how they got there. And your story in particular uh, it, it is really unique. Um, so I just wanted to touch on that. I thought we could start with, you know, when you were growing up, like what were the conversations like at the dinner table? Well, um, like a lot of, like 
my, a lot of people are familiar with my old man. He was, uh, you know, growing up, he was, he was trying to get his business going. He's in the pizza business. Yeah. And traveled a lot, didn't see him a whole lot. Um, but like a lot of families, there wasn't a lot of everybody sitting down with sure. dinner. Everybody was sort of, you know, I had an, an older sister, four year older si- sister's four years older than me. She was a figure skater. Um, you know, I was in hockey and all the sports. So uh, dad was traveling a lot. And so those, those dinner table conversations were few and far between. But, um, you know, a lot of it was, you know, when I, with, with our family, it was, you tried to, those moments when you could get time together um, were special. Um, but I was always, you know, my family, I think like a lot of people's, was very influential. Um, not in terms of pushing in any way. As a young guy, I was like everybody else. I wanted to play. Right? Yeah, you thought you sure. were going to be a player. And uh, went and played in, played in the minors for a few years. And, 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 you know, I don't have a lot of skills. One of them is a pretty good self-evaluator. So a couple of years into it, I kind of realized, you know, you'd go to NHL camp every year and you'd realize, you, you know, one of these things yeah. doesn't look like the other. And um, so I, I, I found out pretty early on that I, I wasn't going to necessarily make it yeah. on the playing side. And if I wanted to stay involved in the game at some point, you're going to have to do something else. So at that part, with my, with my dad's business background, we talked a lot about that, whether I was going to get into coaching, whether you get into management. Um, and he's been certainly influential in terms of his business experience yeah. and a lot of things. He's a cop growing up, you know, grade, grade 10 education and, and uh, went out and, and was, a, was a RCMP officer. Um, by chance, went one day at, at lunch into a pizza restaurant that he'd never seen and and uh, got into the pizza business some years later. So, um, you know, but he's, he's been a big, big influence in my life for sure. I read that um, when you were playing in the minors that some of your teammates noted that you had almost a, a Rain Man-like ability to recall statistics, players, other teams, where they came from. You know, with, hind- with hindsight now, any other tells early on that this might have been um, a career path? I don't know if there was any tell. I loved the game. Like, you loved watching the game, right? I was, yeah. a, I was a big fan. Um, you know, you're always following players. But that's, you know, that's what you did. You, you, you followed players, you know. Um, I was always interested in, you know, looking back... And there was no master plan. Like, yeah. I didn't come out with any type of plan to say, okay, at the end of the day, I want to end up here. I'm going to take all these steps. It was, you know, you just you kind of you played, and then at the end of the playing, and I'll talk about that in a second, but um, I was always fascinated by, by, by team building. Yeah. Like, how do you build teams? And uh, of all sports, you know. Um, you know, I love football. Played played. Played high school football, um, obviously hockey, but just always fascinated on how yeah. teams were built and um, and the thought process behind it. Um, but mine, you know, I, I played was was planning on going back and playing in a former coach of mine um, that I played for in the BC. Uh, I actually played a little bit. He he went on to college, coach college, but he coached for years. Um, where, I w- where I went and played. That was Rick? Here too, Rick Kozabak. Yeah. So he was a long-time coach in Penticton. At that time, they were called the Penticton Knights. Yeah. They're now the Penticton Vs. Been a, been a great um, junior A program for years. And I got a call from him, you know, one summer and just said, listen, he's, he was looking at buying, he had a group of people that were looking at buying a, a, a franchise in the East Coast League. Um, and I had played in the East Coast League a couple, you know, prior to that. And, uh, you know, would I be interested in answering some questions, looking at the arena? Well, one thing led to another, and we ended up saying, instead of buying a team, what about starting a league? Um, which at the time, sound, you know, sounded uh, a little bit pie in the sky. But and that's not really just working. a league. Like, yeah. a league, it was a, that first year, was it, were all six teams in Texas? No, we had, we had five in Texas and one in New Mexico. Got it. And um, so it, it really started that. It was, we got some funding and we basically went out. Um, it was like doing a thesis. Um, we spent the summer running around 
Texas, primarily, going and meeting with, going, going to meet with facilities. You must have got some sideways looks oh from some gosh, of those meetings. Oh my gosh, some of the yeah. stories, you know. <laughs> ice hockey, you want to talk about ice hockey? <laughs> and, um, but really we were going into these old rodeo buildings, right? They were all, all course, old rodeo yeah. buildings that for the most part um, sat predominantly empty in, in the winter. So we'd go in there with this idea that, you know, we had to blow up their floor. None of them had ice, like none of these players had ice. And the, I always say the one thing that kind of helped us tell our story, it was that summer that we were going in there, um, which would have been 90, I think it was 95, uh, 94, 95. Um, the Dallas Stars had just moved to Dallas. from Minnesota. That's right. So you're going into some of these smaller cities at the time. You're going into Austin and Waco and Central Texas and Amarillo, and you could point to Dallas a little bit and say, no, that sport there. And, um, and so, yeah, it was very, very elementary. You know, we, we, we drove around, we were Southwest Airlines and uh, Enterprise Rent-A-Car. We, uh, we did a lot of that and, uh, and we're able to start, we, we gave ourselves enough seed money for basically a six month, will this work? Sure. And uh, we, we, are, we were funded for six months to come back with our findings and say, you know what? this is a stupid idea, let's move on to the next thing, or there's something here, and did it, um, found out there was enough interest, and, and, and we're able to go from there. Well, it's so interesting, too, when you look at uh, the footprint of hockey now in the United States, and I would think if you, you know, follow the breadcrumbs back, like that, you know, while the league's not in existence anymore, certainly had an impact in introducing mm. people to the sport. Um, um, when I... I get a lot of questions from, you know, just based on our community, like, you know, asking for advice on how to progress in, in pro hockey. And, and, you know, based on the conversations I have on this show, I say, you know, the most common denominator that I've found with NHL coaches that at er the early part of their career, they started out in, at the single A level of pro hockey. And my, my thesis on that is that in that environment, you're, you know, you're booking the buses, the hotels, you're, yeah. doing, you're doing everything and you're just, you're, problem solving and putting out fires every day. And that would seem to maybe, um, you know, be a bit of a prerequisite to, you know, to cut your teeth in pro hockey. So, you know, based on that, you know, how did that experience of just, you know, obviously you, you found the league, but when you're operating it, how did that experience maybe inform um, your skill set today? Well, it's everything. And I say that to a lot of people. I talk to a lot of people, you know, a lot of younger people that want to get involved in, um, you know, involved in the game and, and, you know, the biggest thing or the biggest piece of advice I can give is, you know, everybody wants, everybody sees the end, you know, the corner suite yeah. and all that stuff. But, um, you know, you, you have to get involved at the, at the, at the very ground floor. I think in any, in any walk of life, the more you can learn about whatever field it is you're in, um, the more success you're going to have. So getting involved at the ground floor and learning every nuance of that business. And, and you know, to go back to that experience when we were, did the league, I mean, you draw on those experiences all the time. Like to me, we were like, we, we did it all. We, you know, you learn, you know, I, at the time I was mid twenties. I had no clue. I'm sitting presenting in front of city councils and I, I mean, I'm winging it. This is, this yeah. is, we're winging it. And just how old were you at this point? I think I was 26. Wow. And, uh, and, you know, so we were going in and, and meeting with city councils to, you know, like I said, we were doing leases with them for these arenas. And then we went out and we were selling. If you can imagine, we're going to people and selling franchises to a league that doesn't exist in the middle of Texas to play hockey. Um, <laughs> and we got people to actually write us checks, you know. <laughs> and um, so, but, you know, that just happened to be in that business but I, I think it's you know you, you touch on the coaches you know uh, background I think and you know, I look back there's a lot of a lot of guys that I played with a lot of guys that were in our league when we started a lot of guys that have started that this you know that single a double a level and you know a lot of a lot of my friends were coaches and you know when you're coaching the East Coast League and those leagues back in the day you're the coaching is a, about 10 percent of of the yeah. job you're recruiting you're doing immigration you're figuring out how to get from your, your book and hotels, your, you know, your, your, you know, head chef, 
chief bottle washer. And I, to me, that's the best way to get experience, right? Yeah. Um, is to do. And, you know, so you, in the transferable piece in our business now is, um, you know, when you look at the hockey business where I, you know, so I started there and then, you know, my first foray really in, into the NHL with, in Phoenix, you know, I did a lot of scouting, you know, and I think that you, to me at the end of the day in the management side of it, as much as there's, there's so many different things, it's player evaluation. You know, that, that's, that's the end of the day, that's um, in my job, you got to make more, more good decisions than bad decisions. Um, and so learning to, to you know, scout and, and, and identify players and, and learning that um, at that level, I think is, it's critical. Um, so those that want to get involved, whether, you know, coaching, want to get involved in management, it's, it's getting out and, you know, it's not starting at the Toronto Maple Leaf level. Yeah. Uh, very few do that. It's, it's getting out at whatever level you're, you can minor hockey and, and building that. You look at all the, you know, the great coaches, um, you know, Ken Hitchcock always comes to mind. I mean, he, he coached in Sherwood Park for a hundred years. Yeah. Um, working at Edmonton Cycle um, and, you know, built, built a program and, and really learned the basis of it there. Obviously went on to Kamloops and beyond, but I, all the coaches are like that. If you go back to any successful coach or successful manager, there's been a you have to learn your craft. You have to learn your business, whatever business it is. And mine happened to be a unique, you know, a unique path for sure. Going back to the player evaluation. So, you know, you, you, you do the league. Um, your first job in the NHL is as an assistant GM with the, um, the Phoenix Coyotes at the time. And uh, listen, I think it goes without saying that, you know, scouting and player development is, is critical to every NHL team. But I got to think, particularly in Phoenix, like you had to make every dollar go as far as you could, um, you know, hitting on as many draft picks and, and turning them into pros, whether that's on your roster or, or assets that you can trade for other assets, um, must have been vitally important because I sort of sensed that at that time you guys were maybe working with like paper clips and bubble gum to kind of put the whole thing together. Um, does, you know, does, that, does that help you, I guess, from a player evaluation standpoint and maybe just in the sense of looking for finding underlying value and maybe focusing on what players can do versus what they, they can't do? Yeah, it's a good point. I mean, we, we certainly had to do that and we had to find different ways to build our team. And um, when I went into, I got hired by Don Maloney. Don had just taken over as manager. Um, and it, you know, an interesting story, I didn't know Don. I had worked, you know, by this time we had grown our league and actually our, our offices when we started you know, we started, it was called the WPHO, Western Professional Hockey League. We took over the Central Hockey League. We merged them, but we took them over and we took their name. But our offices were in Phoenix. Mm. And, um, and, you know, over a period of time, uh, during, during one of the lockouts, I can't remember what year it would have been now. I guess it had been the 04 lockout. Um, the late, great Pierre Lacroix um, and his son, Eric, at that time, Pierre is the longtime manager in 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 denver with the avalanche so the lockout happens and and we at that time we had a team in loveland colorado which today is now they're the Colorado. they they came into the central league as the colorado eagles they're now the, right. the the colorado avalanche american hockey league affiliate colorado same same building and all the rest of it. they just they've moved up to the american league um but during the lockout the you know pierre and his and his son eric would go up and see this team and the building was full and it was playing in this level, so they had some time in hand, so they contacted me about, you know, what is this league and how do we get involved? So one thing led to another. They ended up buying a team in Prescott Valley, um, Arizona, which is just north of Phoenix. And they built a brand new building. It was a 5,000-seat building. So that relationship grew. And um, I got a call from Pierre one day. Um, and if you knew Pierre, I mean, you know, just a just a great guy, but he was very secretive. Like you, everything. Yeah. I'm phoning you. You can't tell it. You can't tell your wife. You. Um, and he says, "I'm going to retire." This is this is near the end of the season. I said, oh, "Okay." And he says, "I want you to interview. I want to interview for the for the for the Avalanche job." For I want. Got you it. To, to, 
So we went up there, long story short, we interviewed him. He ended up hiring Francois Giguere, at the, or um, yeah, um, Francois Giguere, who was his assistant GM. Yeah. Um, a cap was coming in. Francois was, was, was his, you know, his CBA guy. Um, but he said, you know what? I'm, uh, there's been a change in, in Phoenix. Don Maloney's a good friend of mine. I'm phoning him and telling him he's got to hire you. Now, I always joke that Don Maloney hired me because I was already living in Phoenix and he didn't have to pay me any travel money at any <laughs> moving expense because the team was, we were a little tight on dough. Um, but yeah, so got hired to Phoenix and you were right. We, we went, um, I think it was my, was it after my, halfway through my first year or no, it was at the end of my first year. We're in the playoffs in San Antonio, our farm team. And I get a call from our, our uh, video guy, our video coach in, in Arizona and said, did you hear the news? Team's gone to bankruptcy. We're moving to Hamilton. And I said, no, I'm, they're singing the national anthem. We're playing Houston tonight. Yeah. And from that point on, the league, in essence, we thought we joke with all those players there because we talked to the players and said, okay, everybody, this could take a while. This ownership thing, to, to figure out the ownership thing, it may take a while. It may take a couple of weeks. Well, <laughs> 20 years later, you know. Um, so we were taken over by the league, and the league was great. They were, they were phenomenal to deal with, but you had a budget that, you know, yeah. go do your thing, but you're not going over the budget. But we, you know, we were certainly, you know, we were at the very bottom of the league in terms of, of you know, what our, our player payroll was going to be. So you had to find different ways. And we were proud of that team. I think we, you know, for a number of years, we, we made the playoffs. We, you had a Western Conference championship. Went to a, went to a yeah. conference final. Yeah. So we kind of built it on. We had to, have, you know, we had to really, the margins were thin. And we yeah. had to, you know, we had to find, we had, we had to really find some value in the margins. And my job, as much as it, you know, we relied on, we had to scout well and all the rest of it. Uh, we felt a little bit of pressure is as much as we had to scout and draft well. We internally we talked about we didn't we don't know if we have that much time. Like we got to yeah we got to do that, but we can't wait. Five, the team could be who yeah. knows gone by then. So we really tried to find value around the league. So is there a guy? You know we found a lot of guys in the American League that maybe we think, think can come up and 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 we had Dave Tippett as our coach who played a certain way and where could we find value in guys that played a certain way at a, at a at a low dollar low dollar number but you know certainly i mean it's hard no matter what team you're on you you have a hard time you know in a cap system a, a bad contract affects you yeah when you don't have a lot of cash flexibility it really affects you so that was you, you had to be you had to be precise. Yeah, and I, I would know too. A, a lot of players uh, off that sort of era of Phoenix have gone on to, you know, not surprisingly, management, coaching, etc. Yeah. Probably because they had to survive in the league, maybe a different way. Um, you know, bef before we jumped on the plane to come out here, we were uh, we were filming this this uh, course with Victor Kratz, and uh, I popped in on Tuesday, and he had brought uh, three players on the ice with him. And, I, and I'm watching from the bench, and there's, there's a U18 player, there's a U15 player, and there's this U13, I think he was 11 years old. And I'm watching this kid, and I'm like, holy shit, like, this kid is so good. And, um, and, it, and it amazes me now when I go to a rink like, like Adam Hockey or Youth 11 Hockey, like these kids are, they're doing things that I don't think, like at least for me growing up, like anybody would have thought of. When you look back at when you started evaluating players from then until now, how, how has, um, I don't think it's as simple to say it's just the skill set, but how, is, how has players evolved? Because I think, you know, a lot of the credit to where our game is today is frankly to the, the coaches in this room yeah. who are developing young players. Oh, for sure. So it starts with you guys. Um, I think a number of things. I think there's so much more, number one, they're, they're, there's a higher level of skill, okay? So that's, so why is that, right? There's a higher level of skill. I think, you know, there's more, you know, I look back 100 years ago when I was growing up, right? We didn't have, you know, you went to, playing minor hockey, you went, you had your minor hockey practice. Yep. Um, you maybe got some extra ice, but your, your ice time was minor was, was when you practiced with your team and then when you played your games. Where now there's so much more individual sessions, I find, you know, those, especially at the elite level. 
right? Yeah, Those players sure. are coming up. They've got, you know, they've got skills coaches and they've got performance coaches. And, and now I think there's, so, so that's great. I think there's, that breeds a whole different set of issues um, that I'm sure you guys deal with in, in um, some good, some I think not so good. But number one, I think the skill level is, is, is much better. The training is much yeah. better. Um, again, which I struggle with a little bit here, is I think sometimes to the detriment long-term that we become a year-round sport. Um, so there's, there's, you know, you're on the ice more. I, I, I'm not a believer in it, but I yeah. do think it... it, it um, it adds to the to the skill level, and then the other thing. So so those things, you know, those 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 layers add up. But I also think it's the mentality, mm. right? Um, these guys, these kids coming into our league now, there is no fear to do things that players ten years, fifteen, twenty years would never think of doing, whether they could do them or not. Yeah, was another thing, but. You know, the Michigan, I mean, there was, you know, it was Craig Berube and I were talking about, you know, when he played and if somebody pulled the Michigan, <laughs> it might be, they might still be playing that game right now, yeah, exactly. right? <laughs> so it's a different era, um, better coaching, like, and it starts at this level when I start, when I, when I talk about starting starting at the grassroots, starting at the ground level. I mean, again, I played minor hockey. The coach on the team was, you know, whoever's dad could get off work, you know, for practice. There was no, yeah. you know, there was no seminars. There were, so everything, like, it's, it's everything in society. We've all gotten better. We're smarter. We're, you know, they're, they're smarter than uh, they were before. They're better skilled. There's, 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 there's way more assets available to, to make them better. Um, and then there's, there's a creativity that we haven't seen before, but so that's, it's, it's no question. Those kids coming into our league and there's a, there's a, there's a lack of, there's a lack of, you hate to say fear, but there's a lack of fear, right? There's a, there's a, you know, you need a confidence to play, but there's a lack of, of, of fear of coming in and, 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 and trying to do great things. So I think it's, it's great for our league. Like it's never been better. It's, the skill level's never been better. Um, and then it's coincided in a time in, 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 in the league where, you know, you've now got a cap yep. system. So you need, you, know, you need cheaper players that, are, kids, that are good yeah. players. So, that, you know, all those things sort of come together at one time, but um, no question there. The, the, the level of player and their ability, what they can do now compared to even 10 years ago is, is night and day. So the season's about to get rolling. Don't need to tell you that. Um, but, but when it does, we're going to hear a lot of players, coaches, um, get in front of the microphones and the post-game scrums, and they're going to talk about structure and structure. And, 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 and structure has a, a huge role in our game. Um, however, at the same time, when you watch you know, the highlights each night, I would say um, you know, you touched on the creativity that the, they're they're predicated on creativity and players that are, um, you know, intuitive in terms of their playmaking. I, I think it's fascinating in terms of you know, especially when you're developing players for your team. Like, how do you balance that between the structure and the creativity? Um, and and you know, and, and I sense that has to be something that, as an organization, there needs to be alignment from you know the coaches, management, American League scouts, etc. Yeah, I mean, when you get to our level, at the end of the day, you're, it's about winning, yeah. right? You're trying to win. I really, you know, I, I would go, you know, I had nephews that played when I was in Calgary, young, young kids, and it would really piss me off when you go to a young kid's game and, you know, you're seeing a one 2, two and all this garbage, right? Where, where, to me, the emphasis is on the skill development, right? Yeah. Learning the, 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 now, you coach in any competitive, in, in any competitive atmosphere, you need to be organized, right? You, need, you, you certainly need to be organized. But um, I think 
I think we've taken it a little bit too far, you know, with younger players about, you know, how we how we try to set up structure or have a guy stand here and stand there instead yeah. of playing the game, right? Yeah. At the end of the game, at the end of the day, we need to play the game. And, and you know, as much as the game now is, is structured and you hear that, you know, you hear that all the time at our level and it is, it is important. Yeah. It, l- listen, when you, when you, when you get to that level and, and uh, you know, that's, that's your livelihood that's a little bit different than when you are, are at the minor league level. Um, and I think there still needs to be a focus and an emphasis on, you know, playing versus yeah. structure and, and team play. Um, you can be organized. Sure. Um, you can have a plan and you can, you, can have, you can have a team play as a team, but I... I, I have a problem when when that's when the the what benefits that player of trying to develop his ability, um, you know, is pushed down for, you know, I'm going to have three guys stand in a certain spot because yeah. it, it may give us a better chance to win. Um, but it's it's a big part of today's game at our level, um, and it's you know for years. It's a big challenge when you when you scout, you know, for years now. I think for the most part, you you know the different junior programs or the collegiate programs and and how these coaches coach. But you know, for years um, when I first got in, Kevin Constantine um, coached in Everett. Yes. And you know, it was hard. You, you, it was hard to. It's a game of chess. You know, they'd give up twelve and fourteen shots a night. Yeah. And you're trying to determine. You know, you're trying to make a, a an individual player evaluation, um, and it was hard. It's hard sometimes, right? I bet. Um, so that that is one of the challenges the scouts have is you're looking at these players of, you know, what 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 is the actual individual skill set? What is he able to do, not do, versus and and laying that over, you know, sort of team play. Um, so you you you, you, saw, you draft a player. Um, you invite them into your organization. I'm assuming there's some sort of an onboarding process. And, you know, it wasn't that long ago where, when Fred Shiro had the, the novel idea to hire a, an assistant coach uh, and bring them on the bench. But, you know, now if I go to the Toronto Maple Leafs website and I go to the, um, you know, the hockey operations tab, I got to scroll for a bit with all the people that are a part of your organization. That's not unique to you. That's across the league. Um, so there's a lot of specialists. You've got Haley Wickenheiser, I think, that's overseeing a lot of the player development. Um, how do you guys view, you know, you bring a player in, they're, they're likely the best player on the team that they're picked from, um, but there's no doubt a big gap between where they're at and, and potentially getting into your roster on a regular basis. How do you help them round out their game and help them get prepared to be a National Hockey League player? I think in the last 10 years, Player development has been the biggest growth department. Um, now everybody will talk about analytics and data and all that, um, which which it has too. But just in in sheer numbers and in sheer impact, it's been the biggest department that's grown in our industry in my mind. Like, For sure, I remember coming in. You know, when I first started, you had, you know, you had. We had, we had a skating coach. Yeah. Right? Um, now we've got we've got an entire department, mm-hmm. and, and it's and it's not it's certainly the younger player. That's the focus. Is the players coming in? Now you're you the minute their name is called, they're sort of under your umbrella. And now we we're we're it's sort of the the birth process. Yeah. You know we we're, we're taking that that player hopefully from the time he's drafted from us right through the time that he becomes an NHL player. Um, and Haley oversees that department for us and does a marvelous job, unbelievable job. I knew Haley a little bit before I got here. I've been so impressed in the year that I've been here. And she's, you know, we've, we've got a deep, experienced, um, very involved development staff that, you know, so we, our touch points are immediate and yep. consistent throughout the year. So we have, you know, on ice and off ice people that from the moment they're drafted, they're with this player. You know, now the, the the challenge on the development part, and I and I and I 
I see. I touched on it a little bit before when we're talking about, you know, how these players are better. You know, so we draft a player. We think we're the, you know, this is our, we're the experts. Yeah. Right? And, then we, and I don't say that, I don't say that boastful, but that's our business, right? For sure. Well, a lot of these young players, what I find the biggest challenge with young players now is there's a lot of voices in their head, right? So you've drafted Anybody a Anybody else can relate to that? You know, <laughs> and there's a, it can be confusing, right? And it can be who you, who you listening to. Yeah. And there can be different competing entities, right? So you've got certainly mom and dad, then, you know, the minor hockey coach, then you've got the skills coach, then you've got the nutritionist, and then you've got the agent, then, you, then all of a sudden the NHL team comes in and, you know, they've got their... What do they know? Um, you know, they, they've got their voices there. So, you know, these kids at a young age have got everybody talking to them. But, you know, so it's on ice. It's, it's you know, what I find the biggest, it's certainly the on ice that you're, you're, you're working with them. But it's, it's everything. It's, you know, all these kids when they're drafted, it's physical development that takes yeah. a while. Um, but it's certainly, that's the biggest area that I've seen in terms of the growth is all of a sudden we've got an army of, of yeah. people that are, that are working with these kids uh, on and off the ice. They develop relationships. It's not just the hockey part. It's what's going on in their life, um, which is a big piece of it. But that's, that's, a, that's a huge, because you, if you just look at the success rate of drafting, right? Um, I mean, if you're in any other business, it's not a yeah. great, it's not a great success rate, right? We were, you know, you hit three kids out of a draft that play, it's like a home run. It's kind of right. like being a Hall of Famer in baseball. You just got to bat 300. Right. And, got and um, so you only get so many swings at the plate. And the draft, what they do at 17 is one thing. But now you're taking that, you're taking that, that player who's, you know, who's young and, 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 now, and raw and trying to develop those skills. Um, you're taking that American League player and trying to develop those skills. Development doesn't, and you take it a step further, and, and I can't take credit for it here. Um, you know, Haley and her staff and Kyle, when he was here, really implemented is your development is, there's always a little bit of development with our, with our NHL players. Yeah. I had Mark Giordano in Calgary. He came here, um, you know, at the ripe old age of 39, I think, and was working the development staff every day to, to, to trying to find a, an edge and a way to get better. So... Um, our group works with our NHL players, our American League players, but certainly there's a big emphasis on the on the on the amateur player and the you know the drafted drafted player. I, I want to get to the to the the full time NHLers on your roster, but before I do, so um, uh, two years ago, uh, 2023 draft, um, I'm watching it at home on TV, and, and you guys in the first round you pick Easton Cowan from the London Knights. And, and I'm watching this and my, I've never seen him play, don't know the kid, but my first instinct is, oh man, like what a thrill for this young man gets picked by his hometown team, like just must be over the moon celebrating with his family. And then I go on Twitter and I see this onslaught of uh, experts who are just, you know, frankly, ripping the organization for picking him way earlier than I guess he was slotted. And, you know, and, and, and unfortunately, as it does in today's day and age, like it gets kind of personal and nasty. And all I could think about was, man, this poor kid, as I just know in, in the world that teenagers live in today, like it's tough to avoid that. And I'm thinking, man, this poor kid probably went from one second being on top of the world um, to, to probably not feeling too great. Now, uh, fast forward a year, he has a heck of a year with London, goes to the world junior team, um, you know, it, be interesting to see where he fits in uh, during training camp, but I'd be curious on the mental health side. I think that's something that, frankly, any of us that are working with kids have to be mindful of. How do you, how do you work with these? And, and I'm sure it's not just him; it's the, the the veteran players on your team too. How do you work with them and just managing their their mental health and just overall kind of the social pressures that are that are out there? Well, that's I think, you know, we talk about the differences. That is a huge part of. You know, it's society, right? Yeah. Whatever walk of life you're in, and it's real, and it's it's um, you know it's real. 
Um, and if you don't believe it by now, believe me, it, it's real and it's something you have to pay attention to. Um, and like I said, it, it affects, forget about our industry, or our, it affects every, it, it crosses all lines for every walk of life. Now in our, in our business where there is a social, you know, listen, you use these things, example and players and the, you know, you're in a, you're in a very high profile position yeah. on this team. It's, it's on steroids, you know? Um, so you have to pay attention to it. We talk to our guys, we've got uh, certainly people on staff, we've got experts, but like a big part of my job, I think is you have to, and you, I learned from my kids, right? Yeah. And, um, you know, I guess there's some great things about social media. I think there's a, it's a sewer pot. Um, and so, you know, it was, it was a great example. And I use it with a lot of the guys and, um, and, uh, um, it was Jamie McClellan and I, hopefully he doesn't get mad at me. Noodles. You guys know noodles. He's on overdrive. And, uh, it was a great example. He used it with me one day and he was saying, you know, a few years ago he's on, you know, they've got a real popular show and he's going into a Tim Hortons, um, right by TSN there. And he's getting a, he's getting a, a, a you know, a, a, a coffee. And this guy starts yelling at him and he's sitting over in the corner and he's calling him the wrong name. He's calling him Jeff O'Neill. He says, no, I'm noodles. And he's, you know, he's about 700 pounds sitting in there. He goes, goes near him. He stinks to high heaven. And he says, uh, he goes, noodles. My name is, and he uses some name that he's on social media, you know, whatever his social media yeah. handle is. Well, Noodles shakes his hand, walks out the door and says, he's been corresponding with the guy for a year thinking he's some hockey expert and <laughs> debating with him on the hockey takes. So he's like, here's the guy that's saying I'm no good, you know, and, uh, you know, when I, when I finally do meet him, he doesn't even know who I am. So you, gotta, you just got to be very, very careful. But it's, it's certainly, uh, we try to talk to our guys all the time. It's too easy to say, you know, don't pay attention, right? For old guys like us, yeah. um, you know, but hey, we're, we're, everybody's human. Nobody likes to hear bad things said about them. But yeah. if you're going to get into this line of work, you better get used to it. If, that, if that's going to affect you, this might not work for you. But it's easy at 55 to say that. Yeah. When you're dealing with 16, 17, 20-year-olds, 25, it, it impacts you. It impacts your family. That's what I find a lot, you know. Um, it affects my kids. It I affects bet. my wife more than I, So you have, to, you have to constantly be on guard. You know, you constantly have to be on guard. You have to have support mechanisms in place. Um, but you just have to have your radar up. Um, you know, it's, it's part of coaching now, of, 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 of just, you know, making sure that you've got your radar up at all times. You're talking to your players. I think that's, you know, a big part of, of we talk about having relationships. You can still push people. Yeah. You can still, still be demanding. You can still have high standards and, 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 and high expectations and push people to meet them and, and, and you know, we're in a very competitive line of work, and it's, it's demanding. And yeah. I think those things are, are important and positive, but you have to make sure um, you know what's going on out here. Um, because these things, uh, as much as you want to throw them in the river, they, they, it's, there's a, it's powerful, and it can affect a lot of people. And um, so you have to make sure you're, you're watching out for your, for your crew, and we've got... You know, we've got some really smart people uh, in the mental health field that, that work with us on a, you know, they're on our staff. And, yeah. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a part of life. If you, if, you, if you don't think you are, if you don't think it is, you're, you're sadly mistaken. No, I think, and we're seeing that uh, more and more. We had a, a woman, Larissa Mills, that came down to our event in, in June in Ann Arbor, and that's, that's all she does is work with athletes on, Managing would, you know, effectively almost like a phone addiction and, and obviously the, um, you know, the, the inputs they get through that. Um, I want to talk about some of the, you know, and we'll use two players if it's okay on, on your rosters as an example. And, and by no means do I want to get, I understand that, you, you know, these are 
private conversations. But like, if we were to look at, um, let's say Matthew Nyes, who's a young player, uh, a bit of a throwback as a power forward. He's probably the, my favorite guy to watch on your roster. I'm really excited to see how he develops this year. Um, and then maybe as a contrast, if we look at a Morgan Riley, who's a you know a veteran player established in the league, um, you know when it comes to you know whether it's maybe what they're doing in the off season or, or perhaps even what they're doing in season. You know we had Bruce Cassidy on the show last year, and he made a great comment that in his opinion, you know he kind of compared it to golf where. You don't always have to go and play 18 holes. Sometimes you just need to go to the driving range and, and work on your short game. And just that kind of reference, sometimes players just can't lose a feel for a certain part of the game. But with those two players, what might be some examples of, of some of the direction the team might give them to say, here, go work on this or you know, go work on this part of the game? Well, um, with Maddie, Maddie's, you know, He's had a really good summer. He's, you know, we, most of our, all of our guys, most of our guys are all back. They've been back for a while. And I spent some time with him the other day. He, he is a big man. This yeah. is a big, this is a big dude. Um, and a young guy, right? And so part of, part of, part of with Maddie is he doesn't know how, like, you know, that it's the big guy that walks into the room and starts knocking everything over that just doesn't know how strong he is. Um, that's, that's that's him kind of learning, getting him to understand how big and strong he is, and and how he can use that, yeah. um, you know, use that to his advantage, and and you know, playing a little bit more direct. I think he's, you know, our 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 staff really focused this summer on him on his skating. Like I think every player, um, unless you know, every player works on their skating, right? Yeah. There's, there's you know, there's there's really good skaters, but I think that's always an area. That, fast as our game gets and it seems to get faster every year and Matthew you know I could see it now just saw him twirling around the other day but just being a little bit more upright sure. um, and working on his stride um, and then just you know always a little bit of the it's 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 just getting a lot of puck touches right like a lot of his stuff now is just you know recognizing for younger players um, I mean their skill develop and all those things like you said and I think that's a great comment by Butch is just, you know, you're always just touching on little pieces. You don't have to be out there for hours working on different things. It's, 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 it's refining certain skills. But I find with younger players, and Maddie is another example, to get to the league, you know, at a young age, they've been dominant players. He was a yeah. dominant player in college, and, and you get used to doing things, you know, at a younger age that you think, well, I can just do this and this. Sure. And, and the biggest thing for younger players is puck management, right? And the biggest thing that, you, you know, you hear it all the time, what's the one word that you hear from a coach that just make their hair turn gray? It's turnovers, right? It's managing the puck. It's, it's, and, and so that's, that's one of the things that I think all young players, not just Maddie, and I'm not saying there's an issue there, but just managing the puck better, yeah. right? Where you, you're used to being able just to go through people or go around people or, 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 or have your way with people. At this league, it's, you know, you turn it over, it's going the other way. Yeah. And, and, and recognizing the danger spots on the ice. Um, but those are certainly, you know, his skating and just really being, working on, 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 on using his size, being direct. And, you know, to me, he's the kind of guy when he, when he gets aligned to the net, he's either getting there or somebody's going to have to drag him down. He's that big yeah. and strong. Morgan, you know, Morgan, we're, we're really fortunate. Um, we've got veteran players that are, um, you know, people have said, what is the biggest, what was the biggest surprise or, you know, when you came to um, Toronto, and I, I don't say it's a surprise because it's not like I was thinking differently, but how hard our, our, you know, our top guy, and all of our guys, but our top guys put in. And yeah. Morgan's right at the, you know, he's, he's right there with her. He's constantly working his game, spends a lot of time in our facility in the summer. Um, for him, it's, you know, it's it's just getting his his puck touches. He does a lot of work. You know, this summer just at the offensive blue line, getting across it, um, opening up space yeah. um, at the offensive blue line. But he's he spends a lot of time in the summer on the ice and just you know refining his puck touches. Um, a lot of the work he puts in off the ice physically, but um, a real real pro's pro. Um. You got a new coach this year. 
Um, have, have you played pickleball with Craig yet? I hear he's... I uh, haven't. You haven't? I haven't yet, no. Apparently he's really good. I wouldn't want to argue any calls with him. <laughs> um, but what do you expect him to bring to the team? And I, and I sense, again, he, we, we, we've, he's been on the show before, and my, my impression is that um, he, he's not maybe who he appears to be. He's a really bright guy, a really analytical coach, and, and somebody that is uh, you know, very much in the relationship-building business. Yeah. No, I've been really impressed with, with Craig and – Made a good point there. You know, getting, I knew Craig a little bit. Um, you know, he's been in the league, you know, as a player, obviously a long career as a player, has been a, a long career as a coach. So, you you know, the league is fairly small. In yeah. Terms of, um, you know, you're kind of one person away from knowing everybody. So I, I knew him to say hello. We, 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 we talked often, but I didn't really know him. Yeah. And so, you know, we, we really got to know each other through the, interview process and all the homework I, I did on him and a lot of the people that I know that you know, have worked for Craig, talked to people that worked with him, that he worked for, um, you know, all the places he'd worked prior and a lot of players that played for him. You know, there wasn't, you know, just people raving about him. Not only, I mean, the biggest thing is the, the ability he's got to communicate to players his way with players. It's just yeah. a special way. I had a player phone me the other day, just recently retired, um, and was, you know, he's looking to maybe get started off the ice. And, and we just were chatting. He was looking for some sort of career advice. And, you know, at the end, he says, you know, I played, for, I played for Craig in the minors. And I said, okay. And he said, you know, I played however long my career was, 10, 11, 12 years. He goes, the best coach I've ever had. And he says, tactically and all that, great. But I've never had a coach just, you know, be so straightforward with me demand as much as he demanded from me, but did it in a way that was so genuine, mm. authentic, but he said it was out in the open for everybody to see. Yeah. And he did it with everybody. And, uh, and, and so those are the stories I heard time and time again. So, um, you know, he, and to your point, you know, what I've learned from Craig now, and he's been here for a few months and we're really developing a relationship is, you know, we'll have conversations and, he is he is so sharp. Yeah. So I've I've figured it out now. When he's talking about maybe asking a question, and you're thinking he's just getting his head, he know he already knows he's thought about this. Yeah. Weeks ago, right? So he's, um, you know, a real a real strong mind, a real, um, you know, strong uh, intelligence about the technical side, but he's. His, I think, and like I said, it's it's his his ability to inspire, hmm. um, and and really get to the player. Now again, well, there's you know this isn't all on Craig. Craig is Craig is I think a good coach. Sheldon Keith is an excellent coach, yeah, um, and is going to do great things in his career. And I thought did a marvelous job here. Really enjoyed my time with Craig, and that's the hard part of the business is, is sometimes change. When you're in it, and you just know that sometimes there's, there's, it's time for a change. That's yeah. what I felt. But it, um, we had an excellent coach. Craig is, a, is, a, is an excellent coach. But it's not just, okay, we fired a coach, and he's going to go make everything. You know, he, it's just on him. It's, it's on all of us. But I'm really, it's been really, really enjoyable working with, with Craig thus far. Now, we're, we haven't, we're still undefeated. Yeah. Unfortunately, they're going <laughs> to first place. Make us play some games here soon, and but uh, no, I'm really looking, really, really enjoy working with them. Um, one more. Um, so, you know, everybody's having a quiet summer. Mine's off hockey, and then all of a sudden, it pops up that there's a press conference. The Toronto Maple Leafs, and uh, that, that Austin Matthews is is going to get the C. And um, you know. Today's game, we, we gosh, we measure everything with, an, with analytics. But, you know, the one thing that we haven't quite figured out how to measure, and, and part of me hopes that we, we never do, um, because I think it's, it's, it's still a, a human game, and that is, you know, uh, chemistry and, and selflessness. And, you know, when I watched that press conference, like, I, I think probably like a lot of people, when that news came up uh, online, you're like, gosh, like, what's, what's going on here? But then you watch the press conference and you, you see, 
you know, John Tavares, his family's in the front row. He's passing the torch in such a, such a gracious way. And, you know, my feeling when I saw that was like, you know, like obviously none of us get to hang around your team and people can make all kinds of assumptions. But, you know, I look at that and I'm like, I don't know if there's a truer sign of, of, a, of chemistry, of a good culture, just like the, the mutual respect that you need to win, I think, frankly, in any walk of life. Um, and I'm just curious, what did you learn about your, your team through that process? Well, I've, like I said, I've been around these guys other than a few of them for just the year, right? Yeah. And, um, and been just blown away again with, with how, how this group goes about their business, you know, like Austin and John and, and, and Mitch and Willie, and like the, those top guys you talk about, there's yeah. a reason for it. The work that they put in, yeah. Willie, um, Morgan, um, it's, it's, it's something to see. And, uh, um, you know, John and I had these discussions, you know, at the end of the year. And this was, you know, as I said at the time, this, is, this wasn't, oh, John's not doing his job, so we've got to change yeah. it. it is, that, John's an excellent captain. John's a, you know, if you want to know how to do things right, watch John. Yeah. Us, how he goes about himself, the way he looks after himself. Um, this was more, it's, it's, his Austin is now entering that part where, you know, you, he's our, he's our top dog. He yeah. has got to be in a position where he can, you know, he, we've got to all aspire to get to his level and he's got to drag the group with him. Um, and so we talked about that and it's, it, it's, John loves being the captain of the, of the Maple Leafs and, and takes that job very seriously and did a wonderful job with it. And so it's not an easy conversation. I can but imagine. as I talked about when you have to make, and all of you are in leadership positions, when you feel and you go through it and you really think about it and you come to a conclusion, you have to act. And, um, and so that's where I came to John and we talked through it. And, and he couldn't have been, like I said, this... This shows you the character of the man. Um, is he, he agreed? He was he was on board, um, and it went right kind of to a point of how do I how do I transition? How do I support? And this isn't like okay, John, we don't need your leadership anymore. He's he's sort of walking shoulder to shoulder with John or yeah. with, with Austin, but the manner in which he could do it and how you like I said, especially in a market like this, hundred um, percent. I was, I was blown away with how, how, and it was genuine, right? We've all been there, and I, you know, I'm sure there's still a lot of people say, oh yeah, everybody's saying the right things. Everybody, you know, it was, he was on board. This was, this was, this was, I wasn't dragging him by the shirt collar. He, 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 he was right there, and this was, this was something he thought and saw and, 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 uh, and was a part of, and, um, so I, 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 can't, I can't say, I can't, I can't speak highly enough about John Tavares and, and, and you know, put the player aside, just what he's all about. And uh, I think it was, it was maybe one of his greatest acts of leadership that he's, he's had. And, um, and it wasn't surprising. Getting to know the guy this year, it, it didn't surprise me. Um, well, listen, um, I can only imagine how busy this time of year is. Training camp's around the corner. Um, my, I got a five-year-old, and so uh, every Sunday morning we, uh, we've got practice, and we have three dads on our team that are from Toronto. And, like, it, it's like this on Sunday mornings, right? So uh, I hope for the sake of our practices, we're wishing you guys luck this year. I think we can all agree. I mean, you've got just the, the talent you have here. It's an incredibly exciting roster. And um, But again, really appreciate you making time and connecting with our community. Uh, let's give Brad a round of applause. That was awesome. Thank you so much.